everyone. Let's get started. Uh, welcome to Nano Attack Seminar Series. Uh, we're glad to have Dr. Asif Khan here in our midst this afternoon to speak on this topic negative capacitance technology for low power, uh, low power computing. I uh, want to introduce him very, very briefly. His bio sketch is very well written in your handouts if you have it, if you want to grab it. Uh, Dr. Khan received his PhD in electrical engineering and computer sciences from the University of California, Berkeley, in 2015, and his BS degree in electrical engineering and electronic engineering from Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology in 2007. He joined the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the Georgia Tech not long ago, in spring 2017, this year, and uh, his interests lie at the intersection of electrical engineering, material science, and the physics of computations. So he has numerous awards and honors for his credit, but I want to mention a few. Uh, Dr. Khan, I let him speak on this topic, negative capacity for ultra low power computers. All right, so thank you so much, uh, Paul, for the generous introduction. So again, this is Asif Khan from your very own Georgia Tech. So as he mentioned, I did not join long ago. So it has only been eight months now, and I think many of you are here uh, for longer than that. So my talk is about a novel physical phenomena called negative capacitance. And this phenomena we want to use for ultra low power computing. So just to give you an overview of what my talk is going to be, we are facing a paradigm of electronics where scaling is going to stop. And in this paradigm, what we need is new type of physics and materials that can continue the power, uh, the performance gain in electronics that we were getting before through scaling. So with that, my talk is going to be on a broad scale of different phenomena. So we will start with the physics of negative capacitance, then we will go into the materials part of it, and then from devices and then circuits. So with that, uh, let's get started. So I will get started with a high level overview of electronics and the global challenges in computing. So this era is defined by the internet and social media. And the great thing is that every decade we are generating 50 times more amount of data. And this data includes the data from our social networks, the videos that we watch, the analysis of our DNA, or even the data from that we are getting from the Large Hadron Colliders. And the interesting thing is that we are analyzing only half a percent of all this data. So going forward, our appetite for generating data will, no, will not cease at all. And at the same time, we will be analyzing more and more of this data. And this fascinating paradigm of computing has happened because the industry has done an extremely good job in scaling down our devices. In mid-1970s, we were at 10 micron scale. Now we are going towards a sub-10 nanometer scale devices. And this amazing uh, feat that the industry has done has essentially enabled for the information technology to flourish. But with that said, as we are scaling down our devices, we could not actually make the devices as much efficient as we wanted them to be. So for example, here, what we are showing is that the power density in our microprocessors. Over the years, the power density in our microprocessors has increased. And if the microprocessor power density was allowed to increase the way the rate it was increasing in 1990s, then by now we would have hit a very high temperature in our microprocessors. So what we have done is that almost a decade ago, we stopped the micro increasing our, the frequency of our microprocessors. So it has been stuck at 3 gigahertz for almost a decade now, more than a decade now. And that is all because our electronic devices are generating too much of power. And the, our appetite for this electronic technology also has ramifications in the macroscopic scale. For example, the data centers and servers constitute 2 to 3% of the worldwide energy consumption. Another way of putting it is that the data centers and servers, the carbon footprint of data centers and servers are equivalent to the mid-sized countries like Malaysia and Netherlands. So all said, there is an energy and power dissipation crisis that is happening at the nanoscale. So with that, 
let's get uh, let's get back to the basics and let's see why there is a power dissipation challenge at the nanoscale so what we are showing here on the left is a schematic diagram of a mosfet metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor and this is the basic building block of all our electronic technology and if we plot the current versus voltage characteristics an important feature that we see here is that to increase the current by one order of magnitude, we need to increase the gate voltage by at least 60 millivolts. And this slope is called the 60 millivolt per decade limit of subthreshold swing. And in a transistor, we need to make sure that there is at least 10 power 6 ratio between the on current and off current. And that essentially means that for all our microprocessors, we need to maintain a power supply voltage of at least 1 volts. Now, as we were scaling down our devices, we were making everything small, but we could not scale down our power supply voltage. And in fact, for 20 years, almost now almost for 20 years, our power supply voltage has been stuck at one volts. So we were cramming more and more transistor into the devices and each device was not dissipating less amount of power because we were not being able to reduce the power supply voltage. And why so and it all comes because of the fact that you need to have at least 60 millivolts per, dec per decade of subthreshold swing and the origin of this subthreshold swing is due to the fact that in a semiconductor the carriers uh, follow a distribution called the Boltzmann distribution and because of this Boltzmann distribution it can be shown that the minimum limit of subthreshold swing is 60 millivolts per decade so going forward what do we need to do so the bottom line is that if we take a uh, conventional transistor and do whatever amount of engineering you can possibly do, you cannot go below this 60 millivolts per decade of substitutional swing limit. So the consensus is that we need to reinvent the transistor, meaning that we need to incorporate new physics into the operation of transistor such that you can reduce the substitutional swing below 60 millivolts per decade and essentially you get to a the new device where the switching characteristics is much sharper. So that's the basic thing that the industry is looking for. So in 2008, a new concept came in called the negative capacitance. And the idea is that to replace the oxide with a material that has a negative capacitance. So we will talk in more details about negative capacitance, the basic idea, but the basic idea is this, that you can think about a MOSFET as a series combination of two capacitances the oxide capacitance and the semiconductor capacitance. Now, in a regular MOSFET, both of them are positive. So if you apply a gate voltage, the voltage that you will get at the intermediate node, which is the <coughs> interface between the oxide and semiconductor, will always be smaller. Now, replace this C ox with a negative capacitance material. So your C ox becomes negative, And what you can show is that a smaller change of the gate voltage will create a larger change in this intermediate node voltage. Essentially, you will get a voltage amplification in a passive network. And what it does is that now you can apply a smaller voltage, but you can get a larger amount of charge in the device. And as a result, for a smaller voltage, you can get a larger amount of charge and larger amount of current compared to that in a conventional transistor, which has a positive capacitance. And with all this math, which I'm not going to outline here, uh, not going to talk about, but with all this math, you can show that this negative capacitance can reduce the subthreshold swing below the fundamental limit of 60 millivolts per decade. And this will essentially enable us to reduce the power dissipation in electronics. All right. So with that, the overview. So today's talk, we will talk about materials, then devices. And then what we will do is that what, what we'll talk about is what do we need to do such that this technology becomes a reality. All right, so let's get started. So what is capacitance? Capacit a capacitor is a device that stores charge and capacitance is the increase of charge with voltage. So if you have a positive capacitor and you increase the voltage, the charge will increase. On the other hand, a negative capacitor the charge decreases as you increase the voltage. Now you can also define uh, capacitance in terms of energy. 
So you, we know that the, for a capacitor, the charge, uh, the energy is Q squared over 2C. So if you have a positive capacitor, then the energy landscape looks like a parabola. And the capacitance is the inverse of the radius of curvature of the energy landscape. So you have a positive uh, radius of curvature over here. On the other hand, if you take a negative capacitor material, the charge voltage characteristics will look like an inverted parabola and the radius of curvature will actually be negative. So the first question that we started was with, do we know of any material that has an energy landscape that looks like a, an inverted parabola? And the answer is that according to the Landau theory of ferroelectrics, a ferroelectric material can have an energy landscape like this, a double well potential where the capacitance is negative in certain range of charge. So that's the basic, a ferroelectric material in theory can give a negative capacitance. So a little bit of background on negative on ferroelectric materials. So ferroelectric materials are crystalline materials whose unit cell looks like this. Now if you look at the unit cell, what you will see is that the central atom is not at the center of symmetry of the material, rather it's slightly off-centered. And this slight off-centering of the uh, of this uh, atom gives rise to a built-in uh, built uh, spontaneous polarization, which means that if you plot the charge voltage characteristics of a ferroelectric material, there will be a hysteresis. So for example, and the minima of this energy landscape corresponds to the two direction of the polarization. Now, if we say we are here at this minima, which is quantified by A, and if we apply a voltage, what will happen is that the, polar, the energy landscape gets tilted and the polarization changes along this charge voltage characteristics. And once we apply a voltage larger than the coercive voltage, it switches to other direction here. And then once we get back the polarization uh, voltage to zero, it goes to the other uh, minima, other direction of polarization. So what essentially what we are showing here is that by applying voltages, you can create a situation where the polarization starting from this position can move to the other position here. Now this is the classical description of a ferroelectric material. Now what Landau theory says is that if you plot the charge voltage characteristics of a ferroelectric material, it will actually show look like this and in a certain range of charge, what you will get is a negative slope in this curve. So that's the basics about negative capacitance. Now the question is that ferroelectric materials was first discovered in 1920s and over the last 100 years there has been phenomenal amount of research that has been done in this uh, material system both in material science physics community even in the engineering community but how is, is it the case that negative capacitance was never experimentally measured until now and the reason is very simple now what we have said is that the capacitance is negative in this region, in, in red. And as you can direct, uh, readily see that this is actually a not an energy favored position, meaning that it is actually on the top of a barrier. And what happens is that if you want to put the polarization on top of this barrier, it will automatically fall down to the nearest minima because it's an energy unfavored state. So this essentially means that negative capacitance is an unstable state of material. And this is why if you take a ferroelectric material and connect it directly to an impedance analyzer, a capacitance meter, you won't be able to measure the capacitance because what you will actually measure is the capacitance of these stable states. And in these stable states, you will see that the radius of curvature is positive. And as a result, you won't be able to measure a capacitance directly by connecting a ferroelectric to an impedance analyzer. And this is the reason why negative capacitance was never measured until now. So we need new type of measurement system to actually access this unstable negative capacitance state in a ferroelectric material. All right. So let's first look at how we measure negative capacitance directly. So again, we go back to this energy landscape picture and we start from a certain polarization point here, which is stable. Now, if we apply a voltage, which is larger, smaller than the coercive voltage, what we will see is that the energy landscape has tilted, but there is still a barrier. So what will happen is that the polarization will fall down to the nearest minima, but it won't cross the barrier because the voltage is too small. 
Now, if we apply a voltage larger than the coercive voltage, the energy landscape tilts further and as a result what will happen is that the polarization will roll downhill and as it rolls downhill it actually goes through the negative capacitance region. So that really gave us the insight that by doing a time dependent measurement we might be able to do a direct measurement of negative capacitance. All right. So before we uh, go in uh, to the details, this is how we uh, measured, uh, this is how we grew our materials. So ferroelectric materials, we took lead zircon and titanate as our ferroelectric material on top of a certain kinds of strontium ruthenate met metal electrodes. So this is the, the technique in which uh, we deposited these materials is called pulse laser deposition where you have a vacuum chamber here and a laser comes in and hits a target material and it creates a plasma of this material and then we have a substrate on the other side on a heater and this is how the material gets deposited on the substrate. So this is actually what I did in my four years of my PhD. I was just spending time turning knobs and uh, letting the oxygen in, changing the pressure and all these things. And this material, the growth of this material is kind of tricky because there are a lot of issues with uh, the reproducibility and other things. But the, at the end of the day, what we ended up with was with a very high quality epitaxial ferroelectric films. And these are the two TEM images of this material system that we are uh, showing. And the important thing is that the material is near perfect and the interface between the different material systems are also perfect. So that was another key to our results because we could grow very high quality materials of these ferroelectrics. All right, so now again, uh, back to the measurement. So we did, after growth of this material, after we could figure out how to grow very high quality materials, we get back to a very simple electrical engineering 101 kind of an experiment. So we took a ferroelectric material and connected it with a so, uh, voltage source through a resistor. And this is the schematic diagram of the experimental setup. So before we go into the experimental results, again, let me show you what happens in a regular resistor capacitor network. Now, again, uh, from high school physics, what we know is that if we apply a voltage across a resistor capacitor circuit, the voltage across the capacitor will increase with a time constant of RC, and also the charge across the ferroelectric will increase with a time constant of RC. And the important thing to note here is that if we take any time step delta T and measure the change in the ferroelectric voltage and the change in the charge across the ferroelectric and take the ratio of this, what we'll see is that this ratio is a positive number and this ratio is equal to the capacitance of the capacitor. So in other words, in a regular RC network, the change in the charge and the change in the voltage will be in the same direction. So with that, let's look at the experimental results. So we took a 60 nanometer ferroelectric film and applied a voltage of 5.4 volts. So this is the result. Now this black curve with the white dot is the applied voltage and the black curve with the green dot is the voltage across the ferroelectric material. And here is the charge. Now what you can see is that at the very beginning, the voltage across the ferroelectric increases and also the charge increases. But when you go to this region, AB, the voltage across the ferroelectric is actually decreasing. But in the same time steps, the charge across the ferroelectric is actually increasing. So in other words, during this time step AB, the voltage is decreasing while the charge is increasing. And essentially, that means that you have a dq by dv, which is negative. And this is actually the first time such kind of a behavior was seen in, a new, in, a, in any kind of material. The charge and voltage changes in opposite direction. And then again, when we apply a negative voltage, we see again sa same kind of behavior. The voltage is increasing in this case, while the charge is decreasing. So uh, from these measurements, what we can do is that we can plot the charge and the voltage. And if we plot the charge and voltage, what we can clearly see is that there are certain regions 
where the slope of this charge voltage curve is negative. And this is actually the first time a negative capacitance was directly measured in a ferroelectric material. All right. So, <coughs> again, so when we started this work in 2008, there was a paper that said that, that negative capacitance is great, but there has not been any experimental proof of this concept. Well, fast forward to 2015, there was another article that finally uh, declared that negative capacitance has finally been detected. And that was great because it really uh, gives us a lot of pleasure that we were able to finally show that negative capacitance exists. All right, but that being said, did we actually discover something new? The interesting thing is that even in 1950s, there were many experimental reports that actually showed very similar results to ours. So there were many papers that showed exactly what we were looking for. So what, what it means is that this work essentially was driven by a technological necessity. So we were looking for negative capacitance for technological purposes. We were looking for negative capacitance to reduce power dissipation in electronics. But that allowed us to go back to the fundamental physics of ferroelectric materials and show this effect in a solid, uh, solid way. But that being said, this where has been shown in negative uh, in the literature for a long time, but only because we were specifically looking for it, we could uh, do this proper analysis of the phenomena. All right, so now that we have detected negative capacitance, what's next? So what we want to show is that with this negative capacitance, we can actually do very ki basic kind of circuit experiments, which defies the fundamental laws of circuit theory and electrostatics. So let's first look at one example. For example, what we have learned is that if we have two capacitors in series, the total capacitance will always be smaller than the smallest of, it, of them. For example, if you take two picofarads and one picofarad, the total capacitance will be two thirds of a picofarad, which is smaller than each of them. But now take a case where you have a minus a negative two picofarads and one picofarad. And if you do the simple law, you will see that the total capacitance will come out to be one and a half picofarads, which is larger than the one picofarad. And essentially, this is the experiment that we set out to do. So we took the next experiment was that we took a ferroelectric material and we took another uh, <coughs> dielectric material and put them in series in this kind of a heterostructure here. And these are the experimental results, so I'll spend some time explaining the result. So this blue curve is the capacitance of a 48 nanometer dielectric. And this red curve is the capacitance of a 48 nanometer dielectric plus a 28 nanometer ferroelectric. And what we see is that this 28 plus 48 nanometer uh, heterostructure, total 76 nanometer thick heterostructure actually has a capacitance larger than the 48 nanometer film, which essentially means that this 28 nanometer film is working as a neg negative capacitance. What you would expect to have is that a 76 nanometer uh, heterostructure will have a smaller capacitance than a 48 nanometer uh, structure, but essentially what we are seeing is opposite to that. And what we are seeing is a capacitance enhancement. And this essentially happens because the ferroelectric is working as a negative capacitor. So that this is the first experiment that shows that with these new kinds of material, you can break the established laws of electrostatics and circuit theory. So the next experiment that we did was this. Again, the same structure. But in this case, what we did is we took a ferroelectric material and connected it in series with a simple electrolytic or a ceramic capacitor. And what we wanted to see was whether there is a voltage amplification. Now, what does a voltage amplification mean? Now, again, using the simple capacitor divider law, if both of the capacitors are positive, then the rate, so then the voltage that you apply, get here will always be smaller than the voltage that you apply. In other words, <coughs> 
if you take the ratio of the voltage across this dielectric with respect to the source voltage, the this factor will always be smaller than 1 if both of the capacitors are positive. But if our one of the capacitors is negative, then this ratio will be larger than 1. And this means that you can get a small signal amplification in a purely passive network. Now note that if there any in any network of two similar passive elements, you can never get an amplification. But in this case, because one of the capacitors is negative, you can get a voltage amplification. So with this theory in mind, we went back to do the experiment. So this is the experiment what we did. So what essentially what we are showing here is this black curve is the applied voltage ramp and this blue line is the voltage that we measure across this dielectric. And this is a amplifier uh, that's a zoomed in version of that same figure. And what we can show is that this red curve is the ramp rate of the voltage, applied voltage Vs. And this blue curve is the voltage that we measure across the dielectric. And what we can clearly see is that the slope of change of the dielectric voltage is actually larger than the slope of the applied voltage. And if we measure, if we just plot this ratio dVd over dVs, what we can clearly see that there is an amplification in certain range of voltages that we applied. So again, this shows that you can get voltage amplification in a ferroelectric dielectric series network. And to confirm that this effect is real, we extracted the charge voltage characteristics in the system. And what we again see is that there is a certain region where the charge voltage characteristics has a negative slope. Just like the previous experiment where we, sh we used a resistance and a ferroelectric and we got similar kind of negative capacitance behavior. All right. So now we will switch gears and move on to transistors. Again, where the place we started from was that we want to reduce the subthreshold swing in our MOSFETs. And let's see how we do when we use these materials as the gate oxide in transistors. So to begin with, this is the circuit diagram that we usually use to explain a ferroelectric negative capacitance transistor. So this is this network here under this uh, dotted curve, dotted box is the equivalent capacitance diagram of a normal transistor. And this ferroelectric is uh, defined by this uh, CFE, the ferroelectric capacitance. Now the question is how do we design a transistor which can give a very large, very small subthreshold swing? So <clears throat> the bottom line is this, that you have this capacitance here and what you want to have is a subthreshold swing that is much smaller than 60 millivolts. And what you can actually see is that there is a ratio 1 minus CMOS divided by CFE. And this CMOS is the capacit equivalent capacitance of this transistor network. Now, <clears throat> what you can clearly see is that if this CFE is equal to the CMOS, the capacitance of the transistor, essentially if we set the ferroelectric capacitance to be equal to the transistor capacitance, then you can get a subthreshold swing of 0. So that's the basics of a negative capacitance transistor. So these are some simula simulation results of a transistor. So this black, this blue curve over here is the current voltage characteristics of a transistor that does not have a ferroelectric gate oxide. And it has a subthreshold swing of 110 millivolts per decade, much larger than the limit. Now, if we include a 5 nanometer thick ferroelectric film here, then we can clearly see that the subthreshold swing has increased, the curve has become sharper, and the subthreshold swing has gone down to 82 millivolts per decade. Now, if we further increase the ferroelectric thickness, what we see is that it has gone down below 60 millivolts per decade, 
And then if we finally increase it to much higher values, what we will see is that there is a hysteresis that opens up in the transistor characteristics. Hysteresis meaning that when you sweep the voltage up, you get a certain uh, switching voltage, then when you come back, it does not follow the same path. So the bottom line is that starting from a small value of ferroelectric thickness, as you increase the thickness, your subthreshold swing increases, increases, uh, subthreshold swing decreases. And at some point, you will get a hysteresis in the charge uh, in the current voltage characteristics of the device. All right. So now what we did was a very simple experiment. We took a fin-fed device. So this is the fin of the device in this schematic diagram, and this is the gate ox, a gate electrode. And then we again took another capacitor, which is ferroelectric. And then what we did was we made a simple connection. We just connected one, uh, the one side of the ferroelectric to the gate of this fin-fed, and then use this terminal of the ferroelectric as the gate. And essentially, this looks like an equivalent, this has an equivalent circuit diagram that looks like this. And functionally, it is equivalent to an integrated negative capacitance transistor. So now this is the result that we get. So note that in this case, we used a 600 nanometer ferroelectric. So without the ferroelectric, the device has a subthreshold swing of 60, 65 millivolts per decade. Now when we include the ferroelectric, then we first see a hysteresis. But what is interesting is that when it switches from off to on, it goes up at a rate much smaller than 60 millivolts per decade. Right now, the turn on swing is 80 mill 18 millivolts per decade, and the turn off swing is uh, again less than 60. So this was published uh, uh, last year. So just to make sure that this is coming from the negative capacitance effect, we extracted the charge voltage characteristics of the ferroelectric. And again, in the charge voltage characteristics, we could see that there is a negative slope here, So which essentially ensures that there is effect is happening because of the negative capacitance behavior of the ferroelectric. All right. <coughs> so previously, what in the previous one of the previous slides, what we have said is that the as we increase the ferroelectric thickness, the subthreshold swing increases and at some point we get a hysteresis. So what we did in the previous experiment, we used a 600 nanometer film, then we reduced the thickness to 110 nanometers. And it essentially shows that the hysteresis has gone down significantly. And then when we go to 50 nanometers thickness of ferroelectric, we see that the hysteresis has gone down even lower. And essentially here, the hysteresis is less than 100 millivolts. And also the subthreshold swing is much less than 65 millivolts. So it's around 30 millivolts per decade. So these results essentially show that this negative capacitance effect can indeed reduce the subthreshold swing below 60 millivolts per decade without any hysteresis. All right, so now what can negative capacitance transistors do for electronics? So for that, we did performance projection of these kinds of devices. So we took a 14 nanometer node uh, FinFET and then we developed a compact model of this uh, system. And what we can essentially show is that when we plot the delay as a function of energy, what we can show is that without a ferroelectric uh, a standard fin-fed technology, the delay goes down. Uh, as you reduce the delay, the energy goes up. But what is important to note here is that when you use a negative capacitance transistor, for the same delay, you can actually operate the device at at least one order of magnitude less amount of energy. Again, this essentially means that if you want to operate a NCFET at the same frequency as that of a regular transistor, you can, for the same frequency, you need much less energy. So going beyond that, so we collaborated with uh, Professor Sankyu Lim at Georgia Tech, and we did a full chip uh, analysis using this NCFET technology. So we used an advanced encryption core engine 
and which has uh, close to a million devices. And with this model, what we could show is that the same device without negative capacitance, uh, same chip with, without negative capacitance, runs at 0.8 volts at 2 gigahertz. Now, for the same performance at 2 gigahertz, we need only 0.4 volts in a negative capacitance transistor technology. And when we run the negative capacitance transistor chip at 0.4 volts at 2 gigahertz, it actually requires 70% less amount of energy compared to that in a baseline, in a technology where you do not have negative capacitance. So again, all, all, all told, this is a simulation results, but this really gives us an indication that if we can use this phenomena properly, then this could lead to significant power benefits in electronics. All right, so that brings me almost to the end of this talk. So the question is, why am I excited? and why everyone can or should be excited. Now, one of the things, when we started with uh, negative capacitance, we started with a certain class of ferroelectric materials. For example, the results that I was show, showing was lead, zirconate, titanate based ferroelectrics. Essentially, this class of material is called perovskites. Now, this is a classical ferroelectric and there has been a lot of work that has been done. But the problem with these kinds of ferroelectrics is that this cannot be uh, integrated in standard CMOS processes. This is not compatible with CMOS processes. But a parallel development happened since 2011, where it was shown that a certain class of materials called hafnium dioxide can actually become ferroelectric. Now, what is great about hafnium dioxide? The great thing about hafnium dioxide is that all our microprocessors, all our chips, they all have hafnium dioxide as the gate dielectric of their transistors. And what essentially the work is starting in 2011 from other groups have shown is that if you do a certain kind of processing with these materials, they turn ferroelectric. What does it mean? It means that now we are at a point where we can actually use these kinds of materials in the standard fabrication processes and the negative capacitance transistors, when des uh, if designed properly, can actually go into large volume manufacturing pretty soon. So, and these kinds of material can be grown using a technique called atomic layer deposition, which is stan standard in CMOS process lines. So, that is why these negative capacitance transistors, because of this parallel development in uh, new type of ferroelectric materials, is very exciting because it can really make an impact because of their CMOS compatibility. And there has been many reports already which show that similar kind of negative capacitance is possible in these kinds of new ferroelectric materials. So with that, what do I think about the future of electronics? Now, as we have, as I have told, is that the scaling, uh, as, as the industry knows very well, the scaling has been going on and we are uh, looking forward to sub 10 nanometer nodes in next couple of years. Now, ultimately the scaling may stop at five nanometer or three nanometer, but we have really reached a point where scaling may not be possible after some time. So how do we uh, <coughs> keep on getting the performance gains that we were getting from scaling? So this is the curve uh, of the power supply voltage and the critical dimension that we have been following for last couple of decades. These green dots are the critical dimensions that has been going on smaller. But at the same time, these blue dots are the power supply voltage. And what you can see is that the power supply voltage has not been going down. But with this negative capacitance technology, the scaling may stop. But with this new phenomena, we can keep on decreasing the power supply voltage. And by decreasing the power supply voltage, we can reduce the power. And in other words, we can keep on the same power supply voltage, but increase the frequency of our operations. In other words, by voltage scaling, 
we can keep on getting the performance enhancement without needing any scaling. So that's the outlook that I have for the future of electronics going forward with negative capacitance. So all right, so the last slide, uh, I'm going to just uh, uh, <coughs> outline what are the things that we need to know such that this new technology can lead to a gold rush. So first question is how do we get a new kind of, uh, how do we design an NCFET, a negative capacitance transistor, which has a subthreshold swing of zero millivolts per decade. Now, what does zero millivolts per decade mean? It means that if you have a switch that looks like this, the switch should have an abrupt turn on characteristics. And the way to do it is to make sure that the capacitance of the ferroelectric is perfectly matched with that of the transistor capacitance. Now remember, if you have two capacitances, the total capacitance will be smaller than each of them, but if one of them is negative, then it becomes larger. But if the two capacitances are perfectly matched, but one has a negative sign, then you will get actually an infinite capacitance. Now, that kind of an infinite capacitance will happen over a small range of voltage, but with that small range of that kind of large capacitance will ensure that you get a such a abrupt switches. So one direction of research that needs to happen is to find out how to engineer the negative capacitance in ferroelectrics and also how to engineer the capacitances in a ferroelectric uh, in a <coughs> transistor technology. The second thing that we need to know is that how does the domain dynamics play out and how does it affect negative capacitance? So we did not talk about domain dynamics or anything in this talk, but essentially what it means is that if you take a ferroelectric film, there are regions where up, which are directed in the upward direction or the downward direction. Now, right now there is no, uh, not a lot of understanding as to how this domain dynamics affects negative capacitance. And this is what we need to understand to make sure that this uh, negative capacitance technology becomes extremely successful. And finally, the big question is, what is the speed in which the negative capacitance mechanism occurs? Now, there are many, uh, many uh, <coughs> reports which uh, actually say different kinds of time scales. But uh, what we need to have is this uh, negative capacitance dynamics to happen over much less than picosecond regime. And this is where a lot of studies as well as a lot of engineering needs to go on. So with that, let me conclude the talk by thanking all my collaborators all over the world. So most of the work that I showed here was done during my PhD and postdoc at uh, Berkeley. And some of it was also done here. Uh, and I'd like to thank all the funding agencies that has funded our, our work for last eight years, and especially NSF for uh, funding our current work at Georgia Tech. So with that, thank you so much. And let me uh, have your questions. <laughs> also, in a very nice book, I really like it. And, mm -hmm. and Thank you. you explained it extremely well. Um, the, the question that I have in one of the graphs, you showed you showed that the sandwich that you need is your regular dielectric and metal and the ferro and the ferro. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there and then the ferroelectric. Do you really need that metal? No. So uh, that's a very good good comment, and we have decided that we should not have this metal for many reasons. First thing is that uh, this creates a lot of floating gate effects. So we have decided that we, I mean, we have done a lot of studies lately on the effect of this metal. So this metal should not be there. Okay. So I have just included this for the purpose of explaining the concept. Okay. So and then, I mean, and then you can conceptualize that you would have a regular hafnium dioxide dielectric and then that modified. Right. So. Uh, that's a good question in terms of uh, integration. So 
first thing is that even if we want to put half like regular hafnium dioxide, there is always a intermediate silicon dioxide layer. So, the stack that we are planning is silicon dioxide, then a seed layer of some high K dielectrics and then finally, the version of the hafnium dioxide or any other binary oxide that transfer electric. So, that is a very good question. So, the straightforward answer is that if you look at our structure, it is essentially same as that of a CMOS transistor. So, any bottleneck that CMOS transistor may have, they may have, they will have. So, if it effect, it is affected by the trans voltage transient CMOS transistor, it will also be affected. Now, the thing is that because you are reducing the power supply voltage, I would expect that if the transients will also have a smaller voltage and that way the effect might actually be reduced. But that being said, uh, these are questions that we need to address. Mm -hmm. What are some of the materials characterization uh, that you you know take up during your during your depositions for example? So, uh, this is standard ALD deposition. So, everything happens after we deposit, but uh, from the materials standpoint, uh, there are many in situ characterization techniques that, uh, for example, regular XRD or, uh, yeah, so those kinds of measurement, we actually uh, tried to do some of them uh, while we were working with perovskites. So, those really help us understand how the material grows and how to make those materials much better. So, again the question uh, the question is related to what happens in regular transistors. So, the structure is so much similar to a regular transistor that we can use just the existing techniques. For example, like our microprocessors right now have used what 14 nanometer nodes. So, 14 nanometer node transistor means that one of the size of the capacitor is 14, uh, 20 nanometers. So, we already have that technology. So, we will just apply that to the regular ferroelectric material, uh, the ferroelectric materials based on the similar kind of materials that are already used in technology. Uh, 